This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community, working in legislative, regulatory, and political arenas to promote the free enterprise system. Information at VAChamber.com. Virginia hospitals and health systems provide jobs. They support our economy and promote public health. Local hospitals are always open to help people with unexpected health needs. Having a stable health care network is vital. Virginia hospitals are our lifeline. It's amazing what my students with special needs can accomplish. Their pride is priceless. That's why I teach. Brought to you by the Virginia Education Association. Because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you. Welcome to This Week in Richmond have two very unique guests today, people who usually are ones that uh, you should have brought your microphones with you or something, that have a <laughs> microphone out talking with, with legislators and people here on Capitol Square, Elena Austin with Channel 29 out of Charlottesville, uh, Soraya Wintersmith, who's with WCVE uh, Radio, and, uh, and I don't know, maybe TV too, but with the radio and TV here in the Richmond area and throughout its old viewing area and it's really great to have the two of you on to share some of your perspectives with the viewers about issues that you've worked on and we'll start with Alana because we'll go back prior to this session and then lead into this session but about some of the hot issues that are happening here some that maybe are happening in Washington too that that impact us in Virginia so when you started it was about the time that our former governor was um, in court, and I think that was about the time you began working here in Richmond. Yeah, well, first off, thanks so much for having yes. us on the program. We're uh, really excited to be here. Um, you know, it was really interesting joining the Virginia Capitol Press Corps right before the trial started, uh, the summer of 2014. It was a much anticipated event, but once things began, I think really no one anticipated just how widely covered it would be and how salacious the nature of the trial would get at times with some of the dramatic testimony uh, for weeks you know uh, and even McDonald himself took the stand at one point the case centered around federal corruption charges so former Virginia Governor Bob McDonald along with his wife were on trial and eventually the jury did end up finding them guilty on a series of charges now for those who uh, maybe weren't following all the inner workings of the case, it centered around a relationship that they had with a uh, wealthy business ban, then CEO of Star Scientific, Johnny Williams. And what it came down to was when McDonald was in office 2011, 2012, he came to have a, a relationship with Williams, he considered him a friend at one point, and Williams had an anti-inflammatory vitamin, a supplement, and he was seeking to have uh, universities uh, f with Virginia have state-level research for his product line. So he, you know, befriended the McDonald's and, you know, asked them for help. You know, he was whining and dining them. It came tallied up to about $165,000 in gifts and loans that he gave the McDonald's at that time. And in the prosecution's eyes, you know, he's the governor, the buck stops with him. And in, right. in their view, McDonald, mm -hmm. as someone who was a lawyer, as somebody who was in the military, as someone who was the governor, that he should have known better and, and exercised better judgment. So that was the basis of their case. But all along, McDonald has said that he is innocent of these charges, that it was uh, a misunderstanding, that he was tricked in a way by 
Johnny Williams and that what he did was political courtesies. I think this is something we'll definitely be hearing about come Wednesday, April 27th at 10 a.m. when he does have that scheduled hearing before the U.S. Supreme Court. A lot of us are anticipating that hearing and his lawyers have said what he did they were routine political courtesies and that if the federal law, the Hobbs Act, is applied in this way to public officials, it'll open the floodgates and it will be something that criminalizes political uh, a politician from doing their job and could even, in a way, uh, discourage those from taking up public office. So we're certainly looking forward to going up to D.C. and, and seeing how those arguments unfold. So you, you'll be able to be on the inside? I am working hoping on that, so. Working on that? Okay. <laughs> so as you know, I'm normally based in Richmond and mm -hmm. travel around the Commonwealth, you know, for different stories on this beat, but I am not a regular member of the Supreme Court press corps. So I put in my request for a day pass. They are processing it. I have been tracking the website very closely uh. to see when I could get that request in. So one way or the other, I will be up in Washington, D.C. for the oral argument, and we are hoping to secure a spot in the courtroom that day. But it is certainly a coveted assignment, uh -huh. and there are many reporters in the Virginia Capitol Press Corps and uh, in the national and international scene that will be seeking a spot there. I uh, hope it works out. I can still visualize the the trucks from all the, the networks and that were parked around the federal court building here on, on Broad Street in, in Richmond. It was just amazing. And ones that were left there overnight to reserve their spot during the time of that trial. So hope you get in. Thank you so much. And, and you came in the Capitol Press Corps then in the fall of 2015 and have been covering issues here at the Capitol as, as well as issues that may be before the Supreme Court too. In fact, I think redistricting, something that you've looked at. This is definitely something that uh, we're going to be following at the station, um, particularly the 7th District and the 4th, both of which include portions of Richmond. Um, we already know that State Senator Donald McEachin has declared that he will be running um, we're waiting to see how many other Democrats might want to get in. Um, but the Democrats have already said that they feel pretty strongly um, that he is the one that's going to help win it, uh, just because with the maps that were redrawn, uh, it made the 4th District uh, much more uh, heavily African American. We typically see that African Americans tend to vote Democratic, and so they are anticipating that they will get that seat. With the seventh uh, representative, Dave Bratt, um, is there. He won, I think, with the last uh, election very comfortably, like 60 percent. Um, and there is a Democrat, Eileen Bedell. She is a lawyer, um, been working in the Bon Air area uh, for the last 12 years, um, never held an elected office, but she will be a challenger, and we're waiting to see if any more Democrats uh, step in to that race as well. Yeah, that, that will be certainly interesting, but the district, the way the district is drawn, the 7th, didn't get that many changes in the way the court drew it. Uh, picked up Powhatan, gave up Hanover, maybe some other small changes. Right. So still, still leaves it a predominantly, I would say, Republican mm -hmm. district. Just that Tea Party stronghold that is left out now, but it's still very comfortably Republican. Yes, right. yes. Oh, it would be, be interesting. In the fourth, um, one of the people who had indicated that he, that he maybe was going to challenge Congressman Brett in a Republican primary uh, seems to be indicating that he might be the Republican who would run in the fourth, uh, Sheriff Wade. In Rico, so uh, which which has some people kind of trying to figure out that, but uh, but you live in one place and then run in another. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Well, Congressman Forbes knows about that. And, <laughs> the and, the and second others. district is certainly that issue is coming to light there as yeah. well. And keep in mind, uh, you know, we're keeping in mind anyway that at the U.S. Supreme Court level, where these cases are being heard, McDonnell and this congressional redistricting issue, that there is a vacancy on the Supreme Court. And with Scalia's death, 
there's concern that some of these cases, it could come down to a 4-4 decision. You know, no guarantees. We're not in the courtroom all the time. and We're not behind closed doors, so we don't know how it'll come down. But there's always that possibility that a decision is delayed until a ninth justice is appointed, or there could be a rehearing, or, you know, even with that even number uh, of justices, there's still uh, consensus one side or the other. So we'll definitely be keeping an eye on that. But from what we've been told, a lot of Senate Republicans are not willing to move forward with putting forth a new justice until President Obama is out of office. They've said that they want to wait until the people have spoken, but, uh, mm -hmm. you know, for a new president. Mm -hmm. But a lot of, uh, on the other side of that, you know, Democrats will say, well, the people already spoke by electing President Obama. So that is certainly something we're very interested in, in seeing how it plays out. And it's a risky thing because they don't know who is going to win the election and if a Democrat takes the office and then nominates someone else who is much more liberal. Right, that they dislike more than Merrick Garland yes. because a lot yes. of people have said, well, Merrick Garland is fairly moderate. Others have said he's liberal on certain issues like firearms rights. So it's in the eye of the beholder, but, you know, again, it'll be really interesting to Garland see. Garland might start looking really <laughs> Depending oh, right. on who's elected, exactly. Yes, yes. Well, I guess that's why it had some people taking the tabs. There might be an interim uh, approval, uh, confirmation by, by the Senate uh, post-election while they are still in the lame duck mm -hmm. time. But, mm -hmm. And though right. they say no, that could come back. That's a great <laughs> that, point. That, that could come back if, uh, if they see the... the concern from the Republican side that there could be someone, as you said, more liberal. Right. I tell our viewers we're having this com conversation, certainly here now in this time, before the reconvene session, and even before the deadline for the governor to act, which will be the, the 10th that the governor has to act and either veto or sign or send bills back with, with amendments. Uh, there's. I've never known, not in modern history, of a, a governor who chose the option just not to sign the bill, let it become law without mm -hmm. any action, because mm -hmm. the, the governors usually act. Right. I mean, they always, they act one way or the other. Some of us were talking earlier this morning that there were already 19 vetoes at the time that we're having this conversation, mm -hmm. and, and we're having it well in advance of that April date for the governor's final action. So. There will be lots of things that will be happening on reconvened day this year. And so and this will be your first reconvened Very first. day. <laughs> and, and it's likely to be uh, one of the most ex exciting ones on lots of issues that, that the governor is sending back. Are there some of those that you've been watching, either of you been watching the ones already vetoed or that you'd want to comment on? Well, one of the issues that I had been closely following throughout the session was about the uh, House Bill 516. Some around the Capitol called this the sexy books bill. Some called this the beloved bill. Now, it hasn't been vetoed yet, but many are anticipating one from the governor. It would put in place, uh, ask the, the State Board of Election, or State, excuse me, State Board of Education to put in policies so that if there's a reading assignment that would include sexually explicit content in any type of a book that the kids are going to read or some other material in the classroom that the parents would get notification that it would require that level of communication with the parents so a lot of Republicans have said they feel this is kind of a, an oversight a kill switch if you will for parents if they're not comfortable with a particular uh, some reading material a lot of schools already have something like this but Democrats have been worried that this is as they put it a backdoor to censorship that this is going to lead to banned books so I, I think that'll be that there was some really heated debate on that topic in the, the Virginia Senate floor especially so if the governor vetoes that you know perhaps we could be seeing some interesting action uh, in response from lawmakers and if I'm recalling correctly and you all fill in the gaps of my recollections on it. The, the bill, would, as it is before the governor, would have the, the State Board of Education determining what is sexually explicit. This is an amendment so, that so that, the Senate, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that they would be charged with, with setting the standard, which I, I guess uh, concerns some, but others are satisfied with that, that, that would have a, a gubernatorial appointed board which 
changes as governors are elected mm -hmm. determining that, that standard, but we shall see. We shall see. I think that is definitely another element of this and perhaps an argument against the bill that, you know, where do you draw the line and what do you consider that content? Could it be a passing reference? Is it something mm -hmm. that's, you know, more detailed? Are you talking one page out of a whole 300 page book? Are you talking about one paragraph? You know, it, it, or, or is it something that would be the overwhelming topic of a discussion? Right. So I think that's something that they would really need to take a look at and would certainly put the onus on uh, the board members if it did pass. Mm -hmm. What are some of the issues that you've been following? I know going on the website and we have that address that people can go on, they can see where you've, I mean, you have written material there too, but you've written on some bills as well as reporting over the radio. I'm definitely expecting that we're going to see something uh, dealing with the monument bill that we saw uh -huh. in the session. This is one that uh, has already been passed until the date of the reconvened. Um, it's been contentious in recent years just because of people expressing uh, discomfort with Confederate statues being in public places. So the bill uh, that passed, it passed in the Senate very closely, something like 22 to 17. It passed in the House um, with a bit more support. I think it was 82 to 16. Um, but there are votes in the House to override this that has already been vetoed, this bill that has already been vetoed. Um, and the argument on the right is just that we should not tamper with history, that these things were erected for a purpose, um, and that it sort of whitewashes what we've already established. Um, and the argument on the other side is that perhaps when these decisions were made, um, when we put these monuments up, everyone's feelings about certain wars, about certain figures, about certain positions in history were not considered. Um, and so one person might look at a Confederate statue and feel a whole lot of pride. Another person, Senator Donald McEachin, again, uh, was on the Senate floor and said, hey, some people died trying to defend uh, the institution of slavery that kept my ancestors oppressed. And that's not something that I like to look at when I walk by. Um, I think that there will be some action on this once we get back for the reconvened. And, and the the bill as it is before the governor, and I remember Senator Adam Ebbins' comments too on the floor of the House saying that there's a, a monument somewhere, I think in Alexandria, that's in the middle of the street, mm -hmm. and, it, and it, it would prevent that local government from moving it maybe to even a, a safer place, not, not taking it away. They can't tamper with it at all. Yeah, yeah. so it, it, would pro it would prohibit that, which uh, I don't know if there's any other one throughout the Commonwealth that the local government would want to move because it's in a dangerous spot. Mm -hmm. But but certainly he had a good. I thought he had a good argument on that one point that for safety's sake, he should be able to move it someplace else. Mm -hmm. yeah. And when the governor chimed in with his veto, he did say it would prevent localities from making their own decisions about. So sometimes it's not even about how people feel about a statue, but for mm -hmm. safety. But. As you said, the bill as it is before the governor would prevent localities from taking any sort of action. Well, we all know these discussions have been playing out in localities across Virginia. You know, we heard the debate about Alexandria in the past. In Charlottesville, there have recently been several different demonstrations of groups very impassioned, very strong feelings about these issues, either for removing the statue, for uh, keeping it there. And then I've even heard, you know, some members of the public say, well, instead of removing this, maybe we can have more recent uh, civil rights figures, perhaps, folks in recent decades, so that we are still remembering the past, but perhaps a little bit more of a historically up-to-date way of honoring figures uh, from, from the heritage of Virginia. I don't know if you cover the Henrico County area, but uh, I live in Henrico County, and, and it's not a statue, but the Henrico County School Board voted unanimously to take the name of uh, Harry F. Bird mm -hmm. from Bird Middle School uh, because of someone who, who really was a leader in his era 
that wouldn't have supported public education and wouldn't have supported the, the uh, delightful mixture of folks who now go to Bird Middle School. Mm -hmm. And that's a step away from this historical monuments thing, but I think there, there probably would be some. Uh, there weren't any on the Henrico School Board, but some would say you shouldn't take, take names down. Mm -hmm, Want something mm -hmm. is, is named, but uh, that's apparently been fairly peaceful in Rico County so far. Well, I grew up, uh, I don't know if you all know, in the Richmond area, and so I remember passing by, you know, Elsie Bird High School and, and all these other, you know, growing up around a lot of things named Jefferson Davis, Jefferson Davis Highway, uh, yes. Robert E. Lee. And so, you know, for the longest time, perhaps these issues weren't discussed, but I think in recent years they've really taken on uh, a new life. These these debates and controversies, sometimes they do get quite heated, but it's always good when you hear that folks are talking about it, airing out their feelings, but in a constructive way. And I think that because Virginia does have such a history rooted in you know, a time of slavery, and and there there really is going to be a discussion, and, and maybe we've come to that point where people are really going to take a look at it and and come to the decision if things should stand as they are, if you should build around it, or if you should take them down. So I'm really interested in seeing how that plays yeah. out. But that was really big news for yes. someone who grew up in the area, like right. you know, seeing history and and the current situation mm -hmm. really changing. Right. Before our time runs out, I think we could talk for an hour or more, <laughs> the two of you could. Uh, any uh, Some other issues that you want to bring to people's attention, because they'll be seeing this now. Most people will see it just before the reconvene day. Mm -hmm. So what other issues would you all want to bring up? One other thing that I found very, very interesting from this session was, um, even though it didn't make it out of committee, we saw a bill from Delegate Mark Cole um, that a lot of people label as anti-transgender. Um, this bill uh, defined a person's biological sex and directed the Department of General Services and um, public school divisions to come up with policies that confine male students to go to male designated bathrooms and female students to go to female designated bathrooms. Um, and because the bill defined biological sex according to one's birth certificate, according to one's physical condition. It didn't account for um, some of these concepts like gender expression or gender identity, the idea that I, for example, can be a woman uh, physically but can identify, you know, deep within my own mind as a man. Um, uh, the bill didn't account for that. It was a huge uproar here at the Capitol. Uh, we saw advocates like the ACLU holding press conferences just saying that there's no way that this bill can go forward and ultimately it didn't um, but I think that we are seeing a national trend as well um, with legislatures trying to deal with this issue in Illinois um, yesterday well when this runs it won't be yesterday anymore but uh, North Carolina's Attorney General has said he won't defend a I similar yes. bill mm -hmm. I think that this will come up again is that maybe similar to the one that was vetoed by the governor of Georgia? I think that just in the last recent few days it indicated he was going to veto a bill. So, right, that is what about any other issues, Alana, that you'd want to mention? Well, I'm trying to think here. Uh, one of the things that we didn't talk about that was a huge deal from the session was the, as the governor puts it, the historic gun deal. Uh, yes. Very complex, yes. so we won't delve into all the details right. of that, but it was a little bit of give and take from the GOP and the Democrats, essentially expanding concealed carry reciprocity agreements from, it was on track to really back away from having those agreements with many states in the U.S., and now it will be near universal reciprocity for those concealed handgun uh permit holders. And in exchange, there were more stringent restrictions put in place for certain domestic abusers so that their firearm rights would be taken away. Uh, the governor and certain Democrats hailed this as a move forward. You don't see a lot of compromise on firearms right, issues. Right. Uh, you know, it's certainly very contentious. Uh, certain groups, you know, uh, felt as though it was a step backwards. So it's It'll be interesting to see if there's any further agreements in the works between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. We're already seeing a ratcheting up from uh, gun control advocates. Uh, the mm -hmm. Virginia Coalition for Common Sense just launched and they're going to try and fight 
mm -hmm. or more control measures. Mm -hmm. This is definitely going to be an issue. It's not going away no, at no, any time no, soon, I don't no. think. Even, even with that agreement, that's not the end of the end of the story. The story right. will continue. Surely. Thank each of you for the work that you do around Capitol Square and helping keep us informed, and especially thank you for being on This Week in Richmond. Thank you so much for having both thank of you. us. Thank, thank you. Thank you. We love the show. This Week in Richmond is made possible in part by Dignity Memorial, caring for our communities with a network of funeral homes and cemeteries in Virginia and throughout North America. More information about Dignity Memorial's providers is online at DignityMemorial.com. The Virginia Chamber of Commerce, the voice of the Virginia business community. For jobs, the economy, and public health, Virginia Hospitals, our lifeline. The Virginia Education Association, because a good education is good for everybody. Additional support is provided by these sponsors. and by the members of Virginia's public television stations. Thank you.